Live. We are live. Praise the Lord to the saints that are already online. Genesis chapter 4. This should be very familiar with you by now. Genesis chapter 4. Y'all pray for me, please. And we're going to start at verse 1 again. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked on him with favor and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was not angry, but very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And I'm reading from the New International Version. I know some of you are reading maybe from the King James Version or another version, so mine might differ a little bit from yours. Uh, but nevertheless, the concept and the message is still the same. Amen? Amen. Amen? Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do... What is right? Everyone say right. right. Will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. You must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, again, we glorify you. We give you thanks and praise today. We love you with all our heart, soul, and mind, God. We are so grateful that we are able to gather together in unity as one in the body of Christ, God, to fellowship with one another, to praise you, to worship you, to give you all the glory today, God, because this is the day that you have made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. So we thank you, God. For everything that you are, everything that you're doing. God, I pray right now that you will open the hearts and minds of your people who come to seek a word from you. That your Holy Spirit, God, will open us today. God, let your word be sowed on good ground. We thank you, God, right now. In the name of Jesus, be with me, Lord, in this hour. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Yes. Feeling a little nervous this morning. I think it's because of so many beautiful faces. <laughs> yes, y'all pray for me. Yes, I got, I got Mr. Johnson in the building today. Yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's going to be great to see you here every Sunday. I don't know how I'm at. Uh, I got, I got, is it Miss Bridget? Yes. Miss Bridget? Evangelist Bridget. Evangelist Bridget in the back. Praise the Lord. Hey, we may need to link to Lord Mr. Deacon Darius over here, too. He does a lot of evangelism. I just want to thank all of you for coming today. Huh? Yes. Oh, and Brother Hensley. Hensley. Forget about Brother Hensley. You see, he's hiding back there, right behind Chantel, and I can't see his beautiful face. So, but I thank all of you guys for your commitment, your faith, uh, for coming to Christian Way Ministries. I mean, how about that? Huh? God is so good. I want to thank uh, my family, too, the ministers, for, hey, for coming in this morning and doing what you're doing, for Mama and her hospitality, for my family that supports me in everything that I have going on. Without you guys, none of what I'm doing. Without God, it's possible. Amen? Amen. So without further ado, welcome to part three of God Wants Your Very Best Moving Forward in the Year 2018. <laughs> I, I still got some first aid kits in the back if you need them. Hey, we may need to brace ourselves, right? I want to give God all the glory. You still have yours for giving me this message, which I had no idea was going to stretch into a three-part series. God never ceases to amaze me because when I started doing my new Bible plan, we introduced at the beginning of the year, and hopefully you are still following along with us, the Spirit highlighted the account of Cain and Abel regarding how God wants your very best. <laughs> Not to be like Cain, who gave the very minimum when he offered the fruits off the soil or the ground. But to be like Abel, 
who by faith offered the fat portions from the firstborn of his flock. And as I mentioned over and over and over again, giving God your very best is so much more than what you put in the basket on Sunday morning. Just the other day, one of my Facebook friends, who is a devout follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, posted something I found rather interesting. The article said, Bill Gates, okay, just made his biggest donation in 17 years. <laughs> Not only that, but he donated a whopping 5% of his overall, overall wealth. Now, <laughs> which turned out to be $50 billion. That's a lot of money, isn't it? For us middle class working men and women, we'd be lucky to sniff 1% of that kind of money in a lifetime. And I'll let you do the math in your own brain. <laughs> Yet my brother in Christ said something really profound that I touched on in this series over and over and over again. He said that the poor widow in the Bible who gave two small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny put more into the treasury than what Bill Gates donated to charity. Wow. And I thought to myself, that's so true because when you multiply what Bill Gates donated times 95, what he donated is no greater than the two copper coins worth only a fraction of the penny, the widow gave. But here's the difference. The widow gave out of her poverty and put everything she had to live on by faith, whereas Bill Gates gave out of his abundance and only donated a fraction of what he has to live on. Which, by the way, is no faith at all. Furthermore, <laughs> what Bill Gates donated to charity is a classic example of what Cain did by offering the fruits off of the ground to the Lord. It's one thing to offer out of your abundance. But it's another thing to offer the best of what you have like Abel did by faith. That's why the scripture says in Hebrews 11.4 that by faith Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain did. And by faith he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. Mm -hmm. And by faith Abel still speaks today even though he's dead. Which is the reason why God wanted me to speak on this very issue of faith last week when it comes to giving God your very best. Why? Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, you can't give God your very best. Without faith, your good deeds aren't going to do you any good. And without faith, God will not look upon you with favor. Just like God didn't look upon Cain with uh, Cain and his offering with favor. Amen? Amen? I'm a little nervous this morning. Praying that the spirit will calm me down real quick. It could be the coffee too. I think it's because of your beautiful faces. Uh, that's, that's what I'm going with today. Amen. But the reason why I mentioned uh, Bill Gates at the beginning of this message is not to judge him or to bring him down, but to use him as an example to remind the saints that it's not about how much you give. It's about your faith when you give to the Lord. Just because you donate a hefty amount of money doesn't necessarily mean God is looking upon you with favor. It doesn't mean that you're operating in faith. And it doesn't mean that your heart is in the right place. When it comes to offering the fat portions of your life, it's so much more than what you donate. Remember, God is not evaluating the quantity of what you do for him. God is evaluating the quality of what you do for him. Are you giving God your very best? Or are you giving God the very minimum? Are you giving God the fat portions of your life? Or are you giving God the leftovers of your life? Are you doing everything you can do for God? <laughs> or are you doing the very least 
thing you can do for God. And are you operating in faith when you give, when you serve, and how you live for God? Or are you operating out of your own convenience, out of your own selfishness, and out of your own two eyes? Which one are you when it comes to giving God your very best? Are you the faithless king or are you the faithful Abel? Are you in the race? Or are you on the sidelines cheering for everybody else in the race while you do you? Hmm? Come on now. Some of you just come to church on Sunday morning to hear the word of God, but on Sunday afternoon it's back to the same old worldly routine. Yes. <laughs> the Bible says in James 1.22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. <laughs> That's crazy. Sometimes I got to go in the mirror and look again, you know, I'm just making sure, you know, I mean, sometimes I have a case of the forgetfulness, right? But, <laughs> but the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Okay. In other words, coming to church on Sunday morning just to hear the word of God is not going to cut it. Yeah. <laughs> it's not. Right. In order to give God your very best moving forward in the year 2018, you are going to have to put the word of God into practice. You are going to have to put the word of God and do what it tells you to do. You are going to have to obey the voice of the Lord. And you are going to have to not let the word of God go through one ear and out the other. You see, what we need to do, some of us, before we leave church, when we hear the word, we need to cover our ears and walk out of church like this so it don't escape. <laughs> That's what we need to do. I, I'm telling you the truth. Be not hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. And please excuse me if I sound like a broken record when it comes to putting the word of God into practice. But the only way you can know what the word of God says is by meditating on it day and night. Amen? Amen. And I'm not referring to this kind of meditation that you all understand it to be in the 21st century. The contemplative kind or the reflective kind. No. I'm referring to the kind, of med the, the kind of meditation that ancient Israelites understood it to be 3,500 years ago when the Lord told Joshua, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. This kind of meditation, believe it or not, has nothing to do with just reading it or just contemplating on it, or just thinking about it. No. The Hebrew word for meditation, haga, everyone say haga, haga, all right, means to moan it, to growl it, to roar it, to utter it, and to speak it. <laughs> meditation also means to muse it, or to become absorbed in thought with it. <laughs> and it also means to devise it or to plan to bring about the word of God into your life. How many of you guys knew that? <laughs> That's what true meditation means. That's the way the ancient Israelites understood it to be. And that's the way they meditated on the word of God day and night by memorizing it, by speaking it, and by reciting it. You have to always remember that there were no Bibles during that time. And it wasn't until the 1400s when Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press that enabled Bibles to be printed on a mass scale. But now that we have been spoiled with unlimited access to the precious word of God today, we barely read it, we barely speak it, we barely memorize it, and we barely meditate on it day and night like the Bible commands us to do. So, if you want to give God your very best, first, you have to confess 
with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. <laughs> Come on, say, let's give God some praise. Second, you have to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. <laughs> I'm, go I'm taking you to school today. Third, <laughs> you have to meditate on his word day and night. Not the 21st century version of meditation, but the 1500 BC version of meditation. All right, it says uh, meditate. Here, here goes. Somebody may want to take a picture of that so you can record it. Memorize and bring the memory. Eat. Eat the word. Explain it to yourself. Express it to yourself. Dwell on it for a duration of time. Dissect the passage. Internalize it and personalize it to make it yours. Think over it. Teach it to yourself. Talk to oneself. Apply it to self. Argue with self. Think over it. Teach it to self. Talk to oneself and eat the word. Explain it to yourself and express it to yourself. That's meditation, folks. Four. Oh, somebody wants to somebody wants to take a picture. Go ahead, take a picture. Take a picture. I mean, I read the whole thing. You should have been in what's like. Yeah, and the Samsung users over here. Uh, do it with something. Uh oh, they go that shade. <laughs> they go that shade. Come on, Samsung. Come on, Samsung. All right, four. You have to operate in faith and whatever it is you do for the Lord. Why? Because just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead, right? In other words, are you giving God the fat portions of your life like Abel did by faith, or are you giving God the very minimum like Cain did when he offered the fruits off to the ground? Which one are you? And just in case you are wondering what the fat portions were that Abel offered to the Lord, it was the best parts of the animals, right? It was the best parts of the animals. So real quick, Allow me to put this in perspective for you, okay? Sometimes we can't understand the word until, like Jesus did, put it in a parable. If I wanted to treat my wife to the best steak dinner money can buy, <laughs> am I going to order her a sirloin steak that comes from the back area of the ribs right above the romp? Or <laughs> am I going to order her the ribeye steak that comes directly off the ribs that's fattier than all other steaks? Hmm. Well, before you can make such a decision, you have to know how much it costs, right? <laughs> I'm <a> lion. <laughs> and once you find out that the ribeye steak is $20 more than the sirloin steak, you're going to go get it at sirloin. <laughs> am I lying? I'm not lying. I'm telling the truth. Hey, Brother Rico. <laughs> He's like, yeah, she get that sirloin on that. <laughs> Some more shame. Hey, look, look, pray for me, say. Come on, say. Tell the truth, chain the devil. You're going to get it at sirloin. All right, taste the same. They ain't going to know the difference. Babe, that's ribeye. Trust me, it's ribeye. <laughs> Well, in the same sense, that's the difference between Cain and what Abel offered to the Lord. Cain offered the Lord just the stuff that comes from the back of the ribs, where Abel offered the stuff right off the rib itself. Cain gave the very minimum, whereas Abel offered the best part of the animal. That's the difference. On the other hand, how can we translate what Abel did in the beginning into our lives today, especially since God has done away with the sacrificial system. They no longer sacrificing animals in the temple. What are the spiritual fat portions of your life that you can give God your very best with? Does anybody know? Time. Yeah. Time? It could be one. Anybody know the spiritual fat portions we can give to God today? Your heart and your worship. We talked about that, didn't we? Yes, you wasn't even supposed to answer that. Because it was our conversation that, 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 that developed that part of uh, this message here. Right, but she's right. Your heart, man. That's right, Jesus. Yeah. Now he wasn't saying your heart after he knows the answer now. Right. Jesus said <laughs> in Matthew 22, 37 that the greatest commandment is this. To love the Lord thy God 
with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and also with all your strength, which is the fifth point regarding how you can give God your very best. These are the spiritual fat portions you can give God your very best with. You see, if you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, if you love God more than anybody else in your life, if you love God for what he did on that cross 2,000 years ago, and if you love God for everything he's done for you up to this point in your life, then your love for God should drive you to give him your very best. Your love for God should drive you to operate in faith. Your love for God should drive you to always keep him first. And your love for God should drive you to serve him to the best of your abilities, regardless of how uncomfortable, regardless of how inconvenient, regardless of how unpopular it may be, and regardless of what anybody else thinks. Your love for God should drive you to a life of holiness, to a life of righteousness, to a life of kindness, to a life of gentleness, to a life of faithfulness, to a life of gracefulness, to a life of humbleness, and to a life of Christ-centeredness. That's what your love for God should drive you to do. Which brings me to my final point of this series. The sixth point of how you can give God your very best is to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. Uh oh. <laughs> the Lord asked Cain in Genesis 4 6, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Right. Oh my goodness. Right. Listen, folks, giving God your very best must include doing the right thing at all times. Mm -hmm. No ifs, ands, or buts. Mm -hmm. Nothing has changed since the time of Adam and Eve when it comes to doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord. God is the same yesterday, God is the same today, and God is the same forevermore. <laughs> if God required their very best in the beginning, God was no less than your very best today. If God <laughs> demanded faithfulness back then, God wants no less than your faithfulness today. And if God demanded righteousness back then, God wants no less than your righteousness today. Amen. And guess what, saints? God wants it even more so today after God sent his one and only son to show us how to do it. And God preserved his very own word so we can have access to it. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, which means what to us? that we are without excuse today to be living a life of sin. Right. We are without excuse today to not do the right thing. Mm -hmm. We are without excuse today to not know what the Word of God says. We are without excuse today to keep making excuses while you're still doing the same things in the past. We are without excuse to keep falling for the same traps of the devil. And we are without excuse to be committing acts of adultery, acts of drunkenness, acts of greediness, acts of selfishness, acts of se sexual immorality, acts of fornication, acts of pridefulness, acts of wickedness, and any act that goes against our holy God. Yeah. <sighs> Jesus said in Matthew 5.48, to be holy as my Father in heaven is holy. And 1 John 3, 9 says, No one who is born of God will continue living in sin. Because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. And this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right 
is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love their brother. That's not my word, saints. If you're not doing what is right, guess what? The word of God says you're a child of the devil. And check this out. 1 John 3.12 says, do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and who murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because of his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. <laughs> Hence, when the Lord revealed that to me as I was preparing today's message, I was like, wow. <laughs> yes, this ties perfectly into today's message because when it comes to how you should live your life, when it comes to giving God your very best, and when it comes to doing the right thing, Abel is such a wonderful example outside of the Lord Jesus Christ that demonstrates to the people of God that achieving righteousness is not an impossible thing to achieve. <laughs> too often I hear people say Christianity is too hard to follow. Too often I hear people say Jesus set the bar way too high. Too often I hear people say that we can't achieve the holiness of God. Too often I hear people say that the Bible has too many rules. Too often I hear people say only God can judge me. <laughs> And too often I hear people say, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And miss the part where it says that we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. That grants us the ability to put down our former lives of sin and pick up a new life of righteousness. Wow. All of these excuses. Come on, saints. I'm not talking to anybody directly in here. I'm just fired up right now, okay? But if the Spirit is convicting you in your heart right now, get it together. <laughs> and yet, we have the account of Abel, who was one of the very first figures to ever live on planet Earth, who lived prior to the establishment of the law of Moses, who lived prior to the written word we possess at the palm of our hands, and who lived prior to the incarnation of Jesus Christ, and guess what? Was still considered a righteous man of God. <laughs> and all I want to know this morning is, what's your excuse? <laughs> oh my goodness, if Abel can live a life of righteousness without the law, without the Bible, and without the example of Jesus Christ, what's your excuse? If Abel could give God his very best during a time when things were less developed, what's your excuse today with the things that are more developed? And if Abel could do the right thing before God even spelled it out to them, what's your excuse now that God has spelled it out to you through his own son, Jesus Christ? There is none. So stop making excuses. Repent from your sin, put down your old life and turn to God before something else happens to you. Come on. Oh my goodness. I don't know how many times the Lord has warned me over and over and over again. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. We all know this. But yet the excuses continue. And for those... <coughs> And for those who turn their life to God, remember what Philippians 2.12 says, that we need to continue, everyone say continue, continue, to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. No, you wasn't supposed to repeat that, but you can if you want to. That's called meditation, son. <laughs> Don't get too complacent in your own salvation and get sucked into the lies of Satan that you're covered no matter what you do. Wrong. The lies Satan tells, like my wife would say. The scripture of the hour says that if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? 1 Peter 2.20 says, if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. <laughs> it would have been better for them not to know the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. <laughs> That's what the word of God says. And excuse me. It might sound a little harsh right now with the preaching of God's word. 
But if you can't come to church and hear the truth that shall set you free from the world of deception, where are you going to hear it? Amen. All right. <laughs> where are you going to hear it? Remember, Jesus said in 15, John 15, 19, that you do not belong to the world, which temporarily lies under the power of the evil one. But Jesus has chosen you out of the world. Which means that the only place you can come get, that you can come that's supposedly set apart from the world is the church built on the rock. So part of doing the right thing when it comes to giving God your very best is not to conform to the patterns of the world. You can add that as an additional point there. Don't conform to the patterns of the world. Maybe I need to do a part four on giving God your very best to talk about that, huh? What do you think, Jacqueline? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Some of you are like, no, Pastor, please spare us. <laughs> you gave us enough word already. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And as I close, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Bear with me. The last thing the Lord led me to talk about in giving God your very best pertains to what happens when you don't give God your very best. All right? After the Lord asked Cain, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you don't do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. When the Lord said this to him, Cain had the opportunity to seek his face. Cain had the opportunity to repent from his sin. Cain had the opportunity to give God his very best. And Cain had the opportunity to do the right thing, but instead he chose to do the wrong thing by killing <coughs> his brother Abel. You see, when you are not giving God your very best, mm -hmm. sin is crouching at your door and it desires you. When you are not giving God your very best, it means you are devoting your attention somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And when you take your eyes off the Lord and fix them on whatever it is that has your attention, sin is crouching at your door, waiting to desire. <laughs> and look, Satan be dressing up that sin too. Y'all saw the everlasting choice. My man was dressed in a red suit, looking pretty good, wasn't he? He was ready. He gonna dress it up till you gonna make it look good. When you are not giving God your very best, when you are not trying to do the right thing, when you are not meditating on the word day and night, when you are not denying the flesh daily, when you are not picking up your cross and following him, and when you are not offering your bodies as living sacrifices to God, Satan is crouching at your door. Sin is crouching at your door. The flesh is crouching at your door. Your desires are crouching at your door. Alcohol is crouching at your door. Selfishness is crouching at your door. Drugs are crouching at your door. Depression is crouching at your door. Your unbelieving friends are crouching at your door. The clubs are crouching at your door. All kinds of sexual sin are crouching at your door. Pornography is crouching at your door. Huh? Bad choices are crouching at your door. Your failures are crouching at your door. Your past is crouching at your door. And whatever weakness you have that the devil knows about will be crouching at your door. It's waiting for you. It desires you. It wants you. Oh my gosh. When Moses told the Gadites and the Reubenites, that if they did not follow up with their plan to go ahead of the Israelites in battles in Numbers 32, 23, that not only would they be sinning against the Lord, but you may be sure that your sin will find you out. In other words, when you don't give God your very best, you can rest assured that your sin will find you out. Your sin will be crouching at your door. And your sin will desire you. That's what happens when we are not committed to giving God our very best. But guess what, saints? You must master it. You must overcome it. 
You must be victorious over it. You must overpower it. You must have dominion over it. And you must succeed over it, which can only be done in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gives us the victory to master any sin that is crouching at your door. That's what the cross is all about. <laughs> so as you leave here today, but never away from his presence, mm -hmm. remember the six points to giving God your very best. To confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. To believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. To meditate on the word day and night, not the 21st century version of it, but the 1500 BC version of it. To operate in faith in whatever it is that you do for the Lord. To love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind. To add an additional one. What was it? Strength. And, and, and strength too. And not to conform to the patterns of the world. Right? And the last one. To always do what is right. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. do, do what, what is, is right. right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even, Even when, when nobody, nobody is, is looking. looking. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. I know it. And someone was saying, ain't nobody looking. Uh -huh. Yeah, somebody is looking. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him whom we must have to give an account. Yes, God is good. Thank you, Jesus. And last, but definitely not least, remember what will happen to you if you don't give God your very best. Sin will be crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's give God our very best moving forward into the year 2018 because we can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen, amen. We have Miss Muhammad on there. We have Nareda. Yes, God bless you. We have Eleanor. God bless you. 
Y'all keep praying for me, all right? Hey, next week, Pastor Pie has the mantle. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. 